Hello, I'm Dr. Andrew Cutler, Chief Medical Officer at the Neuroscience Education Institute in Carlsbad, California, and a Clinical Associate Professor of Psychiatry at SUNY Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. Today, on behalf of Teva Pharmaceuticals, I'll speak about the importance of differentiating tardive dyskinesia, or TD, and drug-induced Parkinsonism, or DIP. We'll take a look at how these disorders affect dopamine signaling to better understand why anticholinergics should not be used in patients with TD. TD and DIP are common movement disorders caused by exposure to antipsychotic drugs. It is unfortunate that the term extrapyramidal symptoms, or EPS, has historically been used to describe any drug-induced movement disorder because it is a nonspecific term. TD and DIP are both included under the umbrella of EPS and are often treated indiscriminately with anticholinergic medications. However, this concept is outdated. Today, we know these disorders are distinct and the use of anticholinergics for all drug-induced movements is inappropriate. TD and DIP have different underlying causes, opposite clinical presentations, and very different treatments. In fact, treatment for one movement disorder may worsen the other. Treatment guidelines from the American Psychiatric Association, or APA, and the DSM-5-TR provide recommendations for TD and DIP. The APA guidelines for the treatment of schizophrenia recommend treating TD with a vesicular monoamine transporter 2 or VMAT2 inhibitor if symptoms have an impact on the patient regardless of severity. The DSM-5 cautions that symptoms of TD tend to be worsened by anticholinergic medications such as benztropine. Although anticholinergics are indicated for the treatment of DIP, the APA cautions that these agents can result in multiple difficulties for patients, including impaired cognition, diminished quality of life, and significant health complications. The APA advises that it is important to keep in mind the total anticholinergic burden when selecting a medication for DIP. For this reason, anti-Parkinsonian medications are not typically administered on a prophylactic basis. If an anticholinergic is used, it is important to adjust the medication to the lowest dose that can treat the symptoms in order to minimize side effects. In addition, they should be used for the shortest time necessary. Despite warnings about anticholinergic use, about 40% of psychiatry providers indicated they would initiate benztropine to treat as well as to prevent TD. Clearly, the distinction between TD and DIP is misunderstood among the greater healthcare community. The causes of TD and DIP can help explain their treatment. I hope that after watching this video, you will have a better understanding of their biologic mechanisms, clinical symptoms, and appropriate treatments. Patients with DIP display slowness of movement or bradykinesia. I'll demonstrate how this slowness or as we see here, frozen appearance, correlates with decreased dopamine. In contrast, patients with TD have an excess of abnormal irregular movements. I'll start with a refresher on the neurobiology of normal movement and then explain how signaling is altered in patients with DIP versus TD. We will also review how anticholinergics resolve symptoms related to the mechanisms of DIP versus TD. Movement is controlled by dopamine signaling in the basal ganglia. We'll be discussing a presynaptic neuron that receives the signal to initiate movement and a postsynaptic neuron that transmits the signal to produce movement. Here we can see that VMAT2 has transported dopamine into vesicles where it waits for the signal to be released. When the signal is received by the presynaptic neuron to initiate movement, the vesicles fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release dopamine into the synapse. Dopamine binds to postsynaptic receptors and a signal is transmitted to initiate movement. In DIP, antipsychotic drugs transiently block postsynaptic dopamine receptors. When dopamine is now released, the antipsychotic drug 
is bound to dopamine receptors and the blockade results in reduced dopamine signaling in the postsynaptic neuron. Reduced dopamine signaling results in bradykinesia or slowness of movement. Since the mechanism of DIP occurs when antipsychotics are first started, it makes sense that the clinical signs of DIP occur early, within a few weeks to months of starting or increasing the dosage of an antipsychotic. The exact pathophysiology of TD is not fully known. However, it is thought that chronic blockade of dopamine receptors by antipsychotics results in the upregulation or a hypersensitivity of dopamine receptors. This upregulation results in increased dopamine signaling, which manifests as the excessive movements that are characteristic of TD, which is a possible explanation for why DIP is a risk factor for TD. In TD, a chronic blockade of dopamine receptors by antipsychotics results in an upregulation or hypersensitivity of dopamine receptors. So, TD develops after using an antipsychotic for at least a few months, typically years. Some elderly or high-risk patients may develop symptoms in a shorter period. Discontinuing the antipsychotic may improve or resolve the symptoms associated with DIP. In contrast, reducing the dose or discontinuing an antipsychotic may fail to improve the symptoms of TD or might even induce withdrawal dyskinesia. Anticholinergic agents like benztropine act to promote dopamine signaling. This can help alleviate the bradykinesia associated with DIP, but it is the exact opposite of what we want to do with TD. If we add more dopamine to the postsynaptic neuron in TD, the already upregulated receptors may transmit an even greater number of signals. This could result in an even further increase in abnormal movements. As mentioned previously, guidelines recommend VMAT2 inhibitors for adults with TD. It is believed that VMAT2 inhibitors reduce the amount of dopamine packaged into presynaptic vesicles which may reduce the amount of dopamine released at the synapse and reduce TD movements. If we use a VMAT2 inhibitor in a patient with DIP, it could worsen symptoms, as reduced levels of dopamine being released into the synapse can reduce the already decreased dopamine signaling and further slow the patient's movement. Recognizing the different neurobiology and clinical presentation between TD and DIP can help clinicians choose appropriate treatment. I hope this video helped you understand these differences and will encourage you to apply this knowledge to help your patients.